Good afternoon, everybody. Today, there's been several mentioned about Singapore, so I'm going to try to do justice in the five minutes that I'm given to talk about 60 years of public housing <laughs> development. So it's going to be quite You've done challenge. it before. No, not at all. Um, so this is my outline, and I thought I will start with the context about Singapore. I do not know how many of us have visited Singapore, but just um, to ask what comes to mind when we talk about Singapore's its location. Its location is one degree north of the equator. And for those of us um, who know Singapore, Singapore is a city, it is a country, it is also a collection of islands. There are about 60 islands. Some of them appear or disappear according to the tide. And all of that is about 720 square kilometers and the current population is 5.8 million. And with urban redevelopment, the city, much of the city's population has moved into high rise housing. Over 90% of the population lives in high rise and over 82% of that in public housing and this is a public housing landscape. But this has not always been the case. Uh, during the British colonial uh, administration in 1947, the British Housing Committee actually did a survey of the housing situation in Singapore and concluded that Singapore has one of the world's worst slums. And it was, I quote here, a disgrace to a civilized community. In that period of time, over 50% of the population was estimated to be living in slums and in squatter settlements. And in 1960, in 1960 with internal self-government, the Singapore initiated uh, a large scale public housing, moving the population from the slums to um, high rise housing. And you may ask why? because the government took on the responsibility to provide affordable and accessible housing to the lower income, which until up to that point in time had suffered from discriminatory action as well as inadequate housing. Let me just quickly bring you through uh, the kaleidoscope of the housing trajectory in the 1960s, given the huge backlog and the inadequacy of housing the emphasis was very much on just producing the numbers. It was about producing the largest number of housing units within the shortest possible time at the lowest cost. And you can well imagine that the provisions were very basic. Then in the, seven, in the 70s, um, with much of the housing backlog addressed, there was focus on quality, on comprehensive planning, introduction of the new town model and the neighborhood planning concept. And as we move into the 1990s with globalization, greater emphasis was on identity towards unique spaces designed with nature, environmental sustainability, low carbon development. So we talk about high rise. In Singapore's situation, we have opted for high rise, why? It is a case of a small island with big needs. It's about meeting housing demand, about providing quality environment and living while minimizing the land that we do not have. And you find that many of the all, in fact, all of the public housing estates and new towns, they are not just about housing. In addition to housing, there is a suite of facilities and services that are being provided. Markets, shops, schools, sports facilities, so on and so forth. The concept is a total living concept of live, work, play, and learn within the residential environment. So uh, the residents are able to achieve many of their basic needs within the town that they live. So if you look at this chart, you will notice that only about 50% of the land is allocated to housing. The rest are for the services and facilities. And as I mentioned, the concept is neighborhood. So 
the walking distance is a maximum of about 400 meters, and there will be schools, shops, markets, etc. In terms of transport, it, it is to integrate land use and transport using what we call a hub and spoke concept. The feeder buses will bring the residents from where they live to the transport hubs of the <coughs> mass rapid transit or the metro stations or to the bus terminal for longer journey commute to other new towns or to the city center or to the employment um, areas. The important thing to note here is the emphasis on seamless travel journeys, and in particular on the first and last mile journey experience, that it is convenient and that it is pleasant, because the <coughs> emphasis is on public transport. For those of us who live in uh, Singapore, car, car price, or to own a car and to use a car is very, very high. So the um, policy option is to promote public transport, whether it is by bus or, okay. So the other things that I've been given the flag, so I wanted to highlight that from housing problem, okay, to home ownership, and this home ownership, obviously when we talk about housing provision, you need to have housing assess, and housing assess has been achieved through very clear target groups as well as eligibility rules. Um, these are all published, and you know what you could get from the public housing sector. And for those of us who are not able to afford, then there are rental assistance to help uh, people because the policy is that it is shelter for all. Nobody should be denied of housing. Uh, to help buy housing, to purchase, to move from rental into home ownership, just like uh, Mexico City, we have mobilized our retirement savings fund for the purchase of housing unit, which basically allows us to draw down on our retirement savings fund to pay towards the deposit as well as the monthly mortgage and therefore leaving intact our disposable income for consumption. Um, taking to public housing living, high-rise public living has not been easy. For some residents, because you have different ethnic uh, groups. In Singapore, it is not mono-ethnic group. There are different ethnic groups, and you have to learn the habits and the cultures of the other races because you are living in close proximity. And for some, for the early uh, people, the squatters and the farmers who had moved from their villages, the kampongs, to the high-rise housing, many of them had coping mechanisms or adaptations to the new high-rise living environment. And we have, for example, farmers who would coax their pigs and who would keep chickens and ducks in their kitchen as they go. Oh, um, I think this is reverse. Okay, and these are some of the worries I think I'm told to end. So perhaps I should end with this. What cities can learn from Singapore is that we had set a vision, a vision which is a shelter for all, very clear objectives and policies, as well as setting the institutional, the legal, and financial framework. And it involves starting with a long-term planning process, and importantly, to start from the people from the people and their needs, and to start from the fundamentals, as you have seen, from the space provision, and then refining them over time. Thank you. I think, Belinda, yes, it is unfair to, to ask you to speak for five minutes on this extraordinary story. I think most of us are, are, are just stunned about how you do this, how do you pay for it, uh, and how you did it so quickly, effectively, when other cities around the world have taken maybe 100 or 200 years to go through that cycle. I think the question for all of us is going to be, how reproducible is this model? And if not, why not? And I think we can come back to that. I'm going to just uh, try to uh, ask a question to both yourself, Elias, and uh, 
uh, and Belinda, uh, because Belinda, you spoke about the cultural uh, component of some of these like big uh, shifts in, uh, in housing type, uh, which uh, hadn't come up before, I think, in the conversation. And uh, yesterday, one of the states we, we, we visited here in Addis, uh, it was very interesting that somebody was talking about, I think this was uh, a fuzzle, about how the, the way that it had been perceived that people would inhabit some of these houses and some of, the, some of these estates has come, kind of shifted. And there have been these sort of like tweaks that people have made themselves, where there had been like, say, uh, shared kitchens, for example, or some shared spaces that have evolved into other uses because people have quickly adapted to the discomforts. So I just wanted to hear from you, one, how people have sort of uh, adapted to this like quick shifts happening. And I also wanted Belinda to um, maybe ask you to follow up on um, how did Singapore actually address uh, uh, that, 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 those issues of, uh, of culture and how long it took to actually get to a point where you can say we've got a system that is perhaps, uh, that has got a set of lessons from, from elsewhere? I think to a certain degree, like you mentioned, uh, people had to adapt to, the, to this new kind of uh, way of living because of the spaces. To, to begin with, uh, most of the people particularly the low, from the lowest income uh, group, they come from a situation where they were living close to the ground. Um, and when they go up into these apartments, uh, the space are so limited, um, so they had to fit into this kind of situation. And uh, we hear that the young, most of the young are, or they are okay, but the, the uh, older generation, they have difficulty in, in fitting in in this kind of situation. And that, uh, in terms of uh, gadgets and technology, there was some kind of modifications. For example, you might have heard that we have this injera, uh, uh, the basic uh, food, and now we have new ways of preparing this, this, uh, this stuff, this injera, that fits in in this type of uh, condominium housing. And the size of uh, sofa, for example, it changed it. So they, they advertise this kind of furniture is going to fit in condominium housing. So there is an adaptation in uh, um, production of furniture and then adaptation in the way people live uh, and converting them sometimes. Uh, for example, we have the tradition of having house helpers. So where do they sleep? So they have to modify uh, the kitchen or the bathroom sometimes, uh, or the balcony where they, they make them, they made them sleep. So there is a two-way kind of modification. On the one hand, the space had to modify to fit into the way of life. And on the other hand, the way of life should, modi should be modified to fit into the spaces. Um, I would like to, to first emphasize that <coughs> Singapore's public housing program or development is still very much work in progress, it's not completed. So it is very much work in progress and still learning by doing. Um, in terms of um, accommodating and understanding the residents' needs, the different cultural background and the different uses of um, the spaces, there is public education. So the Housing and Development Board at a very early period of time would issue magazines that will be distributed free of charge to all the different, uh, to the residents, to the households, to inform them about how the lift functions, how you know utilities, how the refuse chute works, so on and so forth. About civic mindedness of living together in high rise, high density environment. So there is this kind of campaigns and public education. And importantly, it is also about research research and development to understand what is actually going on on a daily basis. So researchers would camp out in one of these flats in an estate, you know, and would observe what is happening on a daily basis and bring these back to the engineers, to the architects, to the designers, to fold them into the next cycle of improvement. Thank you very much. We're going to move to Arif in a moment, but so that everyone is aware, we started a quarter of an hour later than planned, so we're going to end around 6.15.
So don't run away at six o'clock simply because it was on the program. You now realize the program is an incremental uh, project, not unlike uh, uh, the city itself. Um, I know that uh, Jose has a sort of now an allergy to the word mass, but I think Arif, your experience in Pakistan and the sheer numbers that you're talking about is of enormous interest to all of us. So uh, please give us your overview.